Hey, hockey fans, welcome to TSN's YouTube channel. We're going to bring you updates each and every day of the Stanley Cup playoffs with reports from Mark Masters, who's covering the Leafs, Farhan Lalji with the Vancouver Canucks, John Liu, who's with the Winnipeg Jets, and, of course, Ryan Rashog with the Edmonton Oilers. Speaking of which, let's go to Edmonton right now. Rashog standing by with hockey insider Pierre Lebrun as we get set for game one tonight between the Oilers and the L.A. Kings. Guys, Connor McDavid's at the top of his game. The Edmonton Oilers have the number one record in the entire NHL since Chris Knobloch took over on November the 12th. If the Edmonton Oilers don't go all the way and win the Stanley Cup this year, are we going to be left saying, <laughs> man, the Oilers blew their single greatest opportunity to end the Stanley Cup drought by Canadian teams, guys? Yeah, you think to that cup or bust statement, right? That idea, McDavid and Dreisaitl. And I often wonder, I get you want to win the cup, but what does the bust part of that look like if you don't? It's a tall order. And I think that the players were just kind of turning a phrase there, but it's a fair question. This is, Pierre, in my mind, this is as good a chance as they've got. I mean, they are, they are deep. You know, they have improved in areas where they needed to improve. There's been internal development. Players like Ryan McLeod and Vinny D'Arnais and guys that have learned these lessons and suffered these scars – this sets up to be their best chance so far. They're not perfect, Pierre. There are still holes in this lineup and on this team. But, Gino, it's a fair point. You know, this is definitely the year. Pierre. I think it is, Ryan. And, and the thing that's compelling about the cup or bust narrative that has been in this market since last May is that it didn't come from you guys covering the team. It didn't come from, from fans. It came from Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl, the two superstars of this team, perhaps in a – in a moment of transparency with emotion at the end of last season, essentially said, we got to figure this out. We want to win. And that's why it's important to me that, that there's this narrative because it's the two superstars who have pushed it because they want to get there. And it reminds me so much of when Nathan McKinnon, after losing in the 21 playoffs, and you may remember Nate McKinnon being so frustrated and the ache in his voice about wanting to win and is it ever going to happen for him and the Avalanche and, of course, a year later, we know they won the Stanley Cup. Listen, this league is so close. I'm not going to sit here right now and say it's finally going to happen for the Edmonton Oilers. The league is too close. There's too many great teams. But it's important, again, to underline that the guys that are fueling this narrative are the guys that matter. Well, and the, the other thing I'll add to that, Gino, quickly, is there, there's another layer to that statement because, as we all know, and we'll spend the entire offseason right. talking about it, the contract right. situation of these two players. Dry saddle, the negotiating yeah. window opens up this year. What if he's not going to do a deal? Is that the bust part, right? Mm -hmm. McDavid is the year after. So the idea that it has to happen now or who knows, there is some actual you know, reality, potentially, that comes with that statement. And, of course, if they have tremendous success in these playoffs, doing that new deal is going to be a lot easier. Now, I want to talk to you about the route. The Edmonton Oilers would never admit in a million years, boy, are we glad we got the Kings again. And up until the last couple of days of the regular season, we didn't know for sure who they were going to get. So now they get the Kings for the third straight season. Does that matter? Does it matter that it's two times in a row they've knocked off the Kings and now they're facing them for the third time? You've spoken to players on both sides. Is it in the Kings' heads? Does this help the Oilers with their confidence going in? I don't think it. I don't think it helps either team. I mean, the bottom line is the players know each other so well. Dowdy knows his minutes are going to be against McDavid. Uh, you know, Mike Anderson was kind of joking today that, yeah, we know who's on the Oilers' power play. I mean, he's right. seen so much of it, and the and the Kings' penalty <laughs> kill has improved this year, but. It, it, to me, it might come down to some new faces in this rivalry. And, and for me, Pierre-Luc Dubois is a name right. that I think about heading into game one tonight. Let's just be honest. It has not been a very good year for Pierre-Luc Dubois in his first year of, as an L.A. King, signing a massive eight-year deal. He's been an up-and-down player. But Jim Hiller, when he was asked about Pierre-Luc Dubois today, said, well, you know, he's had his best moments at this time of year, and he went back to the bubble in Toronto, you know, where – Pierre-Luc Dubois was a one-man wrecking crew in helping Columbus upset the Maple Leafs in the bubble. And it's true. Dubois' best hockey has been in the playoffs. Can he bring his game up in time here to salvage what's been a lackluster year? So, Gino, I'm going to throw this back at you. I want your opinion on this because Pierre and I discussed this okay. yesterday. So, so here's my thought. So the LA Kings, their core players for two years, have laid their heads down on their pillows at night and thought about where they weren't able to get to and why. And it's the Edmonton Oilers that have been in their heads trying to beat a team three years in a row. I think there's something to that, right? The Kings, 
they're going to be a frustrated group. They're going to be a desperate group. They mm -hmm. know what this challenge looks like. So that, to me, is interesting. And on the other side of things, I think had the Oilers gotten the Vegas Golden Knights in the first round and beaten them, that is a springboard result for this Oiler team. You beat, beat out the Cup you champs. You beat the yeah. Cup champions. You beat the team that yeah. beat you. You're off and running. Gino, what do you think? If the Oilers beat the Kings this year in the first round, they were supposed to. Exactly, and I agree with you on that. But you know what? It's nice to ease your way into the playoffs. I hate saying that publicly <laughs> because fair. now it's like there's no easy. An easy That's opponent. a good point that he made. I, <laughs> it's an easier way to make your way into the playoffs rather than get hit in the face. Was speaking of getting hit in the face, Drysaitel and McDavid. We have seen repeatedly yeah. trying to put these guys on separate lines, and then repeatedly when they get in yeah. trouble, we go, you know what? Let's put them back together again. We know they're going to start game one tonight with Dreisaitl and McDavid on separate lines. But two questions. Why, <laughs> if you're going to go to them anyway, and how long <laughs> do you think that lasts before you put them back together again? Yeah, well, I know you you deeply considered doing Pierre and I in separate hits today. <laughs> but we are so clearly stronger together, I think it makes sense. And that's the thing, Gino, Fair. the results. So the orders always start the series with them on separate lines, right? Yeah. To win a Stanley Cup, you got to have the depth, and they need to be on separate lines. Well, as soon as something goes wrong, they're on the same line. I was looking back through my notes from the last two playoff series, and the first two or three games, it's always separate lines, separate mm -hmm. lines. Mm -hmm. And then he puts them together, they get put together, and the series swings, and they win the series with them on the same line. So why not just start there? But, Pierre, I think it has to do with this. If you start them together and it doesn't go well, now what? You're going to separate them and think you get better results. It's kind of like they love that emergency release valve, breaking the glass right. in case of emergency. They want to keep that option in their hip pocket. I think that's the exact. That's exactly it. Why use that right away? Because you know it's there. And the other thing is, I think it's interesting the way the Kings are coming into this series. They've got offense spread out on four lines. Now, I get the sense they're going to shorten their bench in a hurry in some of these games. The so-called fourth line, at least on paper right now, has Dubois and, and Byfield. Come on. Yeah, let's be real. The but they have Fiala, you know, on on a so-called third line. They have pieces offensively on four different lines, and I think it's because they feel that matches up the best against Edmonton for that reason. Right. Depending on how the Oilers decide to either keep, you know, Drysaitel and McDavid separate or not, the Kings are telling you, hey, we think there's times in the game where one of these lines has someone who can score. So I I, I think the Kings lineup had Edmonton in mind big time. And I think Gino like. It, when you play them together, you force the Kings to decide, is it going to be Kopitar or is it going to be Dano? When you play them separately, the Kings can generally get one of those defensive mm -hmm. centers out against each of them. So I think a lot of it depends on how those personal matchups are going. And if the Oilers decide to overload, it's shown to be too much for the Kings to handle. The Kings have done a great job with this defensive system. They've got the 1-3-1 in the neutral zone. It works great for them, but it hasn't worked well for them against the Oilers. Do you think they keep yeah. sticking with it, trying to make it work? Or is there a chance oh, yeah. they they show that initially and then switch things up? We, we'd be stunned if they came out tonight. It was like, what is that? Yeah. Look at all those four checkers. I mean, we'd be surprised. Yeah, no, their DNA is that 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 is what has worked for them. But I said this yesterday, Ryan. I still think because they've lost against the Oilers two years in a row trying to play their system, I think there's a moment in this series if they fall behind where they're going to have to tweak it to some degree where they're a little more forceful on their forecheck. I, I just think that at some yeah. point you can't go down swinging three years in a row playing the same system and thinking you're going to get a different result. At some point, if you're down in this series, you got to do something different where it's like they may not expect this, and I think that will happen. You need sure-handed defensemen that can transport the puck, right? Because mm -hmm. the idea is there's no forwards to pass it to because they're stacked up through the middle. Uh, Evan Bouchard can transport the puck and make a good solid dump. Ryan McLeod on a third line can do it. McDavid, Drysaddle can do it. Nugent Hopkins can do it. The Oilers have good puck transporters, and in a lot of ways, that's the remedy for a team that tries to gum up the middle of the ice. All right, let's get to Stuart Skinner. Here's a guy who, let's be honest, uh, got off to a brutal start this season, but since Knobloch took <laughs> over the team, he's top 10 in goals against and save percentage which has been an amazing turnaround and number one in wins, but he's only got five wins in the postseason. Is that a detriment? I mean, Ry, you know Skinner very well. Is he mentally prepared for this next step? 
Oh, yeah. The one thing about Stuart Skinner is that you know mentally he'll have himself in a good place. He, he studies that stuff. He knows it. Like, Stuart Skinner is so funny. He's the only goaltender I've ever covered where you'll be interviewing when you'll say, you know, Stuart, you played really well in that first period. What went well for you? And he'll go, thank you. And then he'll answer the question. He is so calm. He is so zen. He is so chill. And and I think Skinner mentally will be able to, you know, put what happened last year in its proper place. And I think that he'll be in a good headspace. He's handled questions about that all year. He's handled them pretty well, mm-hmm. Pierre. Look, you, you're not going to get the credit for it until you've done it. And, you know, the results weren't what he wanted last season. But I would be surprised if Skinner came out this year, Pierre, and looked like he wasn't able to meet the moment from a pressure standpoint. Well, and I think he's got to be so eager to want to do that because he got pulled three times in the Vegas series, right? Yeah. I mean, that's an awful way to go into the offseason thinking that you're one of the reasons why your team got knocked out. And let's face it, he was. Um, but he's had an amazing bounce-back season. I, I have the ultimate confidence that Stuart Skinner is a guy that's ready for this for this moment. However, I find it interesting that you asked head coach Chris Knobloch today about the idea of perhaps seeing Calvin Pickard at some point in these playoffs. More from a rest standpoint. No, I know. I know you weren't suggesting, but it's still not something you're used to in the playoffs. It's like number one goalies, number one goalies, they're supposed to be playing. And his answer, I thought, was revealing that while he is planning to ride Skinner, that it's not out of the question. Yeah, that perhaps at some point Pickard does get a start. Pickard has been been so quietly good this year like mm-hmm. Vinny D'Arnais was the team's nominee for the Masterton Calvin Pickard was right there and, and I would argue could have easily gotten that he's been an unbelievable story Gino when you look at the number of games he's played in the American League hadn't been in the NHL for a number of years and then you look at his numbers this year they were off the charts so they're pretty confident in Calvin Pickard should the need arise and, and I just want to add you know before we go back to you that the other at the other end of the ice, we, we have to touch on it. I mean, Cam Talbot's had some great stretches this year for this L.A. Kings team, but he's also had some baubles, and including Late in last season, Thursday yeah. night when the Kings are trying to figure out who they're going to play in the first round. He wasn't very good against Chicago. Let's face it, there's a reason we believe that at the trade deadline, the L.A. Kings tried to trade for Linus Olmark, and it didn't happen, but, you know, that, that's a big part of this series, obviously, is which version of Cam Talbot do we see from the Kings? We may very very well see the best version because we've seen that he's how had do you think great... how do you think the kings felt about ending up with the orders like gino what was your read we were all paying attention to the players and we're like how hard are they actually celebrating here are they glad that they landed the oilers yeah. like i wonder deep well, down Dallas how was the alternative i don't think there yeah, was a good result true. either that's way a good point but, yeah. by you. i don't know gino what do you think they're gonna they're gonna tell you no no we want the Oilers because they got them we wanted the Oilers because we want to prove we can get by them so that's fair enough guys so many storylines yeah. We're going into game one tonight in Edmonton. Ryan Rashog and Pierre Lebrun, thanks for setting the stage, guys. And a reminder, tune in every morning to TSN's YouTube channel for all the latest news from the Stanley Cup playoffs here on TSN.